What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Still battling uh, sinus stuff. It's been ongoing for some time now, so I don't know when it's ever going to end. Anyway, um, I just wanted to do a video with, I guess, just really general tank updates, um, kind of uh, where I'm at right now. So, I last, you know, I think the last video that I posted um, had the uh, dinoflagellus outbreak. Uh, I think that I've pretty much got that tackled. Um, it looks like what's, you know, in all the sand bed and everything right now uh, appears to be uh, a greenish tint. Uh, so it, it should just be algae. Um, I don't see any remaining evidence of dinos. Um, pretty much kicked it fairly easily um, and pretty fast. So that's kind of, uh, that was a shock and surprise. I thought it would take some time uh, by what other people have said. Uh, so let's see, what I actually did to treat it, I did, well, is it like a two day lights off? And then during the time I've raised my nitrates and phosphates, my nitrates today are currently at 14 and my phosphates are at 0.12 so uh, I did the, the elevated nitrates and phosphates um, I have been also dosing Microbacter 7 daily uh, I bought some of uh, Per Reef Dude's little thing he was trying I bought some of the Brightwell sponge excel like silicates whatever it is um i can show you in a minute uh, what all the stuff is but uh dosing that and also per the reef dudes video what he was doing also dosing some hydrogen peroxide um i also have but i haven't been dosing it daily and i've been trying to offset it to dosing the Microbacter 7. I have the Dr. Tim's Eco Balance bacteria as well. So I've uh, been dosing a little bit of that. So I'll, I'll dose the uh, Microbacter 7 like in the morning and then the evening um, dose the, uh, the Eco Balance. Uh, let's see, I did remove the Pax Bellum uh, Chato reactor or algae reactor. I think it, it's kind of strange to me because if you've watched my videos, the sole purpose in adding that was really just to uh, help with the pH. I was hoping that the, uh, the algae growing inside it would consume um, CO2 and raise my pH. So I ran it like uh, opposite of the aquarium or tank light schedule. And I ran it all through the night and then about 30 minutes into even when the uh, tank lights came on. And, you know, started about 30 minutes before they went off. My pH has been, the at the low has been 8.0. And the high has been like 8.0 one to 8.12 I think I've hit point eight point one four times so here's the interesting thing since I've removed the Pax Bellum algae reactor my pH has actually increased after removing it it makes no sense to me, and I don't understand why. If anybody knows more about that, you know, feel free to chime in. I thought that the, like I said, the algae would remove CO2, therefore raising the pH. Um, the reason I removed it is because of, you know, having to dose so much of the um, nitrates and phosphates. I was just, you know, I figured that right now it was just pulling too many nutrients out of the water. So to help make things um, 
more balance for now. You know, my, my tank since the reboot, like I said, this tank is two years old, but since the reboot, the reboot was, I think, what are we now, like four months or something like that. So the tank since the reboot is still new, you know, so um, I was thinking along those lines and, you know, I figured yeah, I'll save the Pax Bellum in case, like, I start having issues with nutrients down the road and I can add it back or whatever, but I pulled it off the system for now. But anyway, my pH has increased since removing it. So now the low still gets down to 8.0, but the high, it now hits 8.2. So, uh, yeah, I have no idea why, but that's the only you know, other, the only variable or the other thing that's, the only thing that's changed. So I found that interesting. So now I'm at the, you know, about a couple hours in the lights coming on or whatever, I'm hitting 8.2 and it's carrying 8.2 uh, most of the photo period now. So I guess that's good anyway. Um, I've never been able to hit any higher. I've never hit 8.3 and some people say 8.4, 8.5. Even with uh, dosing caulk washer, I'm just, uh, I'm not hitting that. <laughs> if I increase the caulk washer dose any, then it's increasing my calcium and alkalinity too much. So it's kind of, uh, I've got it set dosing kind of where I found balance and all of that. Uh, I would like to dose more to increase the pH more, but, uh, I feel pretty good about where it's at. You know, uh, originally this tank would dip down to, you know, 7.8, 7.7, um, those kind of numbers. So I feel like uh, I feel like it's not overly bad. Uh, of course, the rasp back there is stirring up sand and things. Uh, sometimes the rasp just darts into the sand and knocks stuff around everywhere. If you have them, I'm sure you're aware of that. So anyway, um, that's one change. So the the dinos appear to be gone. The algae reactor has been removed. The pH is doing better. I'm still running the NIOS Quantum Skimmer. With it... Um, it, it works. I mean, there's there's no no doubt there. I guess my complaints with it would be, it still releases a lot of micro bubbles into the into the sump, and uh, some of them make their way to the tank. Uh, so that's uh, and then the other part is you know when your uh, when your probes are in the sump in that chamber. And then you're pulling water from that chamber for the uh, for the trident testing and things. You know, ideally you don't want the micro bubbles, so uh, that's one downfall to it. And and like I said, if you followed along with me when running the uh, reef octos, never had an issue with micro bubbles in the sump. Um, I ran the uh, I forget the exact model, but one of the elites. Uh, the highest end you could get basically by Reef Octo. Started out with that one in the tank and uh, there were some things I didn't like about it but it, it seems to be a trade-off at this point. Um, I didn't feel that it was worth the money uh, what they charge for it whatsoever uh, but it did not release micro bubbles into the sump. So that was a uh, one of the changes. So next I went to the Royal Exclusive. I had the micro bubbles in there from it. Uh, I think it was really way overpriced for what it is, but, uh, but it did the job as well. Um, so now I'm on the, the NIOS Quantum and uh, a lot of people swear by those. I don't know if uh, mainly with these YouTube channels, I don't know if people are just getting them for free, you know, or, or what the deal is. Um, I don't get anything for free. I pay for all my stuff. So uh, there's nothing on my tank that I've received for free. So I just give my honest opinions on everything. Uh, but with that skimmer, I have micro bubbles in the sump. 
And the other complaint, when when you shut it off to do maintenance, when it kicks back on, it just blows micro bubbles out everywhere and the whole tank gets filled with them. Uh, and it takes a few minutes of running before that stops. Uh, the other thing is being an AC pump, uh, it is louder or it does make some noise. So, you know, if you're, if you have your tank in a room where you just, you know, you don't want any noise from the tank, it wouldn't be a good skimmer for you because it is kind of noisy. Um, it's not that bad with the cabinet closed. I can still hear it. Uh, not, it, it's not loud. Let me just, you know, go back and say that it's not loud, but you can hear it. Uh, let's see. I mean, other than that, it works. I, I don't have any complaints with it. Um, I almost like in one sense, the almost plug and play to it of not having a DC pump and separate controller to mount and to fool with that, you know, it's just, it's an AC pump. It's just a power cord off of it. Nothing else, you know, is kind of simplistic as far as that goes. So, uh, you know, take it for what you will. It's, there's there's pros and cons to every skimmer I've used. Uh, I've had somebody recommend uh, Dell Tech to me, and uh, and I might try one of those next. You know, I'm, it's not that I'm on the search for the perfect equipment, but I do like to try out new equipment. And and like I said, this tank, I'm looking at it and I consider it almost. I don't really want to say test tank, but it almost is because with this tank, I've been, since I've had it in two years, I've switched out a lot of equipment. I've tried a lot of different products. I've tried to dose a lot of different things. Um, so I'm basically, you know, just kind of on a mission to find the equipment, brands, types, all that good stuff that just suits me the best. And when I get all that nailed down, I want to, you know, I want to find the equipment that makes life easiest for me, that works the best for my tank. Um, you know, maintenance wise is the easiest and, and that does, you know, just overall does best for my aquariums. And then I want to take that and apply it to the next build that I do. So that's kind of my game plan. Um, I do want this tank to be, my plan was and still is for it to be somewhat of an SPS grow out tank and I want to start growing out these coral colonies and that way, you know, when I start up my next tank, then I can just frag a lot of them and start over. Um, I'm not going to, the plan is when I get a new tank one of these days that I'll probably frag a piece of all the corals I have in here and then just sell this tank as one complete setup and then buy all new equipment for the new tank and uh, new fish, new rock, everything. Kind of start it over from scratch and apply all that I've learned to the new tank. And then, you know, one of the other things is, like everybody knows, I have fermented snails in here and found no way I can possibly get rid of them. So I definitely don't want to transfer that to the new tank and I will definitely be doing a lot of things differently to ensure that I never get those with a new tank. Because if you know anything about them or if you have them, they are just a, a pain as far as, they're not a huge threat to corals unless they're beside your corals. If they're somewhere around your corals, they spit out their little web stuff, you know, it can irritate your corals. Um, it's not that they're just a huge threat, but it's just the fact that they take over a tank. I mean, they just, they pop up everywhere. And it almost seems like every other day I'm going in here and crushing them. And I mean, they just show up. So it's just, you know, that's the, to me, it's the bane of reefing is uh, the vermin and snails. Um, once you get them, I just, I don't know of a way to get rid of them. So yeah, I'm still dealing with those. Um, corals. So with those, I've had issues with my corals coloring up for some time now. And I have, before I was keeping my 
uh, nutrients, my phosphates at like 0 0.03, 4, somewhere around there. And then my nitrates, I kept around 5. Maybe I needed them higher, I'm not sure. You know, uh, that seems to be, you know, some people say that that nutrient range is adequate, to, uh, you know, for coloration of SPS. Some people run them higher. I think it's a lot of opinions there. You have to just find what works best for you, like with everything. But uh, I think I've traced down really what my problem has been. And, and I'm not 100% sure, but I'm just sharing what I find and, and all that type of stuff. I found I've been using to test salinity uh, every like couple days. And when mixing my salt water, I always use my HANA salinity probe or, probe or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I calibrate it often and I've been really heavily relying on it. Well, I also have the HANA digital refractometer. I've also had the Milwaukee. And and I also have the regular ATC bulk resupply uh, manual refractometer. But I've never, I've always had issues trying to figure out, it seems exactly, or pinpointing or getting the salinity exactly 1.025 or 1.026, what some people say, you know, one of those two are the most popular or common. Everybody says you don't want to go over 1.026. And you, a lot of people say you can go down to 1.024 for corals, but that'll be the lowest. Um, I feel like and think that my salinity was probably high because when I tested with the HANA, then it, it showed fine. When I used the HANA uh, digital refractometer, it shows fine. But when I used my manual refractometer it always showed high so I went back and I was I was blaming and thinking at the time you know I, I have first of all you know I have the the Neptune Apex salinity probe in the tank and it was showing high but I figured maybe it'd be off even though I calibrated I tried calibrating it and I recalibrated it and is constantly showing 36.4 uh, parts per thousand or whatever. Then with my uh, manual refractometer, I was showing something similar to that. Um, I was showing like 1.027, you know, right in there, two, yeah, but really about 27. But then with both the Hannahs, I was showing 1.025. I kept thinking maybe that I have the bulk reef supply, uh, was it refracto juice or fracto juice or whatever. So is there a calibration solution for the refractometer? I kept thinking, you know, for a little while, I was like, you know, is, is just this, did I get a bad lot? Um, or is something wrong with that? Is it, when I, am I calibrating this refractometer right? You know, so I kept questioning it and having doubts. So I've got kind of two test methods showing high salinity, like 1.027 roughly, and then two methods showing 1.025. And I'm calibrating all of them. So at that point I was like, well, I, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, so what I did then, I finally decided I ordered another manual uh, ATC or whatever uh, refractometer from Bulk Reef Supply and two more bottles of the calibration solution. So I got those in 
and so I've got two manual refractometers and I have two different bottles of solution. So I calibrated both of them separately with the separate bottles. Then I took tank water and checked it and both of them were still showing my tank water to be really 1.027 between between 1.027 and 1.028. So I was like, well, I've got a new one and then two new bottles of calibration solution. And I also took the bottles of calibration solution and I let them float in the tank for like 15 minutes um, in order just to, you know, kind of get the same temp uh, as what I was testing. So then, you know, I kind of, I'm, I'm hoping that's going to be correct. I, I think those are a reliable way and probably with a lot of reefers is probably the most preferred way to test your salinity, but you are relying on your calibration solution. So as you know, there's, there's room for error in, in all of it. But anyway, with both of those showing high, I went ahead and I took out some of the salt water out of the tank replaced with RODI water and now I have both of the refractometers showing 1.025 or just under 35 really so uh, I mean I think 35 works out to be 1.026 something for whatever it is the longer portion of it so I'm, I'm coming in really right under that well, I did that and it's only been one day and uh, one change that I noticed, the forest fire digitata already has a little bit brighter color to it. I'm also seeing a little bit more color or a color ring around the encrusting part of a couple other corals. So that really has made me think that my salinity has probably been high this entire time. So now I'm gonna start monitoring it and checking it with, I guess I'm just gonna stick with the manual refractometers and try to just keep those calibrated and use those. Um, like if I, if I use the HANA right now, it's showing my salinity level is 1.023. So I'm assuming that that's what's going to be wrong. And I've gone back to, I have the packets of their calibration solution and I've recalibrated it. I would think it would be right. I mean, I, and I followed the steps that you're supposed to. I, I put the packets in the sump, let them get you know, tank water temperature. Uh, then I put it in there and let it run its little calibration thing. But uh, I guess I'm just gonna stick with the manuals for now because I believe that was my issue. So anyway, which that kind of, it stinks in one sense because I really do love the little HANA salinity checkers because they're just so easy and convenient. You know, just I calibrate them uh, once every Really, I was calibrating it like once every couple weeks when I did my water change on the water box 35. Uh, I do it every two weeks, and, and when it came time for that water change, that's when I mix some more salt water and stuff. So I would always calibrate it first, but then I would kind of just do checks periodically with it to make sure everything was good. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I'm gonna see what happens now. Um, the other reason why I thought the manual refractometers may be wrong was the, uh, the ICP test. So when I send that off, you know, like I said, the, the manual refractometers prior to all this were showing uh, the 1.027. When I sent my ICP test off, they said my salinity was 1.024. So, uh, 
you know, it's just, like I said, I'm, I'm almost, it, it's been a back and forth thing, you know, so ICP show 1.024, Hannah show on 1.025, um, on both of theirs, the, both of their, the digital refractometer and then the little handheld, and then my Neptune Apex and my manual refractometer were showing uh, like 1.0278. So I had a range <laughs> between test and all that of 1.024 all the way up to like 1.028. So anyway, we're we're going to try this route and uh, and see what happens. I, I don't. I mean, I've got. I guess that's pretty much all the different um, salinity testers you can really get. I mean, I don't know of anything else. So uh, I have that many different ones and calibration solution for all of them. So anyway, uh, I guess that's enough of that, but I'm gonna try that route. Uh, let's see, what else? Still dosing the caulkwasser, no issues there. I like it. Um, it's currently, it, you know, it meets the, it's meeting the demands of calcium and alkalinity. I'm dosing almost the amount that's evaporating daily. Um, I could probably do just a little bit more. I had it, right now it's like uh, 3,000 mLs per day. And when I bumped it up to 3,200, then, um, then it was raising over a few days, you know, it was raising over my auto top off uh, sensor so I knocked it down to 3,000 and now it's not you know racing above that so that's kind of uh, where I'm keeping that for a little I don't understand either for a little while uh, I am running the calcium reactor but I'm not it doesn't have any co2 going to it right now um, I was for a little while I was still having alkalinity and calcium dropping so I was running CO2 to the calcium reactor and supplementing with that. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what changed, then it started creeping up. So then I shut off the CO2 to the calcium reactor. And ever since, it's kind of just been maintaining with the, uh, with the caulkwasser. So we'll take that for what, it, for what you will. It, uh, I'm using the Trident and doing the daily testing for that stuff to monitor the um, calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. Then uh, once, uh, when I do the water change on the water box 35, that's kind of when I break out test kits and all that stuff. So I do it once every two weeks. Um, I don't, I never test manually magnesium, but I do test uh, alkalinity. Most of the time I don't test calcium either, so really just the alkalinity. Um, I'm using the, uh, I have the Red Sea and also have some API test kits for it. Uh, but it, it, it shows like every time that it's, it's spot on with what the Trident's showing, so uh, I feel like it, you know, does a pretty good job. I keep, every time I change my reagents out, I do that calibration as I'm supposed to. And, I think it's uh, I think it's pretty accurate. I, I have no complaints with the Trident. Um, only other news. I know this video is getting pretty long at this point. Uh, the only other news is the Reef Kinetics Reefbot Lab. Um, the unit that that came in had a, a defective part to it. They sent me another part, and. Uh, and I was trying to, attempting to repair it myself or change out the part and ran into kind of some issues with it. So, uh, so those guys are, uh, they're sending me a new unit. And uh, as soon as that comes in, then I'll do an update video, you know, of kind of the, the status and progress of that. I will say, and I'll say in the next video as well, the, uh, the Reef Kinetics customer support are super responsive and super helpful. So I, I can't say anything, you know, negative against them as far as that goes. Um, 
I don't have a Mastertronic. I was debating whether to get the Mastertronic or the, uh, the ReefBot Lab. I chose the ReefBot Lab um, mainly because almost like with anything, there's a lot of mixed reviews. There's a lot of negative stuff with the Mastertronic. And then a lot of people have said that their customer support is horrible. So I took that into account with the Mastertronic. And then the other thing I don't like, I've said before, I didn't have any cabinet space or anywhere to conceal or hide the Mastertronic. So it's going to have to sit on top of a shelf in open sight. And I didn't really want something orange and white sitting on top of the cabinet. It just stands out. Um, the Trident kind of stands out, but at least orange and gray isn't as bad as orange and white. Uh, my wife wishes I'd get rid of even that, but uh, I, I kind of need that one. So, uh, so I went with the uh, Reef Kinetics Reef Lab, and uh, I like the way it looks a lot better. And, uh, you know, I, I got a defective unit in, but I buy myself, I buy a new car every three years. And every time I get a new car, it seems like I have issues or there's problems or something wrong, you know, and you have to take it back to the computer reprogrammed or, you know, what, whatever the case may be. Uh, it, it's like anything you buy. When a company's making a bunch of a product, you know, you're going to have some bad ones. So I, I don't want anybody to just think, you know, all of a sudden, oh, well, you know, he made this video and he got a... A reef bot lab and uh, it was defective so they're they're not good or whatever you know I don't want anybody to think that um, I, I did pay for it it was not given to me um, I ordered it because I felt like it would it offered more and would be a better fit for me than the Mastertronic and uh, and yeah, I did get a bad unit, but their customer support has been uh, very stand up. You know, if uh, if I shoot them an email, then they you know they respond in less than twenty four hours. I mean, every time. So uh, so just you know, a, a kudos to them uh, for that one. But anyway, when I get that new unit in, I'm looking forward to getting that set up and going, and then we'll do some. Uh, I'll do some videos on that you know, and, and how I like it and anything I don't like about it and all that general stuff. Um, yeah, kind of ran long with this video, but hopefully uh, maybe you got a little bit of information out of it and maybe I have some stuff that when I go back and look at one day, it'll help me as well. Let me know of any questions you have, any comments. I'm always glad to answer anything I can and I always say I'm not an expert on anything. Um, Everybody always asks me, oh, what do you know about it? Or people try to, a lot of times, comment and tell me, like, you know, very basic stuff. Uh, I have been doing salt water for over 20 years. Um, I started out years and years ago and did that old story um, where, you know, it's just fish-only aquariums for the majority of my life. Uh, so, but the, the part of this that I am new at, I am new to SPS corals. Um, within this... Uh, two-year stretch is my first time ever doing SPS. So uh, it is definitely a learning experience for me. And not only that, things in the reef hobby have changed so much. So, you know, when I used to set up tanks, it was, you go to the store, you always buy a live rock. Um, you were, at one point in time, you know, I was limited. The only salt I could even get was instant ocean. Um, limited as far as help resources and we're talking like 15 years ago 20 years ago all this stuff uh even when i started getting my first like uh anemones and uh leathers and stuff like that um it's just you had to figure everything out for yourself and now there's a wealth of information everywhere but uh so many things the the complication and all of it to me seems like uh there's so many varying opinions you know you you get dinos. Well, you have two people tell you to do one thing. Four people tell you to do something different. Ten people tell you to do something different from that. And then, you know, then there's like argument. Well, that's crazy. That doesn't work. You know, there, it's just so many, so many different opinions in the hobby. 
So like I say, I'm not an expert. I'm doing these videos in the chance that one, they might be entertaining for some. I like to watch anybody's videos on YouTube when I get to sit back and look at their tank and equipment and see what they're doing and how they're handling things. I just enjoy doing that. It's not necessarily even that I'm looking for information. I just enjoy watching it for the entertainment aspect. Uh, I do have a few, you know, dedicated channels that I watch, like uh, Parker's Reef, uh, Reef Dudes, uh, that I watch for more informational purposes. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I give my honest opinions on stuff, and I give the information as I have it, and and my experiences, and and what's going on. So. Uh, I'm always glad to help any way I can. So if you do have a legitimate question, you know, always feel free to ask. Um, you can also see over on the side here, this guy, my uh, Leertail Antheus. I had one that morphed into a male. Last time that happened, I kept like a video documentary on it, you know, as the as it progressed, the stages of it. This time I hadn't done that, but. Yeah, I do have one that's actually changing over, so that's always kind of neat. All right, this video has gone way too long. Uh, I apologize for that, but anyway, thanks for watching.